Pencil Kings, Pencil Kings, Pencil Kings, Pencil Kings, Pencil Kings, Pencil Kings, Pencil Kings. So if something doesn't work, it doesn't matter because you've only invested, what, five, ten minutes into it. You've made a mistake and then you learn from that mistake, which is, you know, you don't learn unless you make mistakes. It is Wednesday, and that means it's time for another episode of the Pencil Kings podcast. And today we are talking with Katie Grierson. Hi. Who? <laughs> hey. And you know what? Before I get into anything, Katie, why don't you give people kind of a one minute overview of what you do so they just get a little bit of a sense of who we're talking with today? I'm a freelance concept artist and illustrator. Um, I mainly focus on landscapes at the moment. And I'm still learning, but it's always good to keep learning when you're an artist. Um, I mainly work for Fantasy Flight Games doing the Lord of the Rings stuff. And my goal is to work for Magic the Gathering eventually. Fingers crossed. How long have you had that goal to work for Magic the Gathering? Because I feel like that's a a goal that a lot of people have. Um, A good few years now, basically since I started freelancing in around 2009. That feels like the sort of pinnacle because they're such high-end illustrations with the like the most amazing fantasy artists sort of around and it's just like that that that's the goal for now and then maybe one day I'll have another goal once I've done that okay and how many artists do they hire each year how hard is it to get to achieve that goal um I can't actually tell you how many but there seems to be a lot like most of the artists I sort of aspire too and really enjoy looking at their work they they tend to have done some work for magic even if it's not fairly recent um like noah bradley titus hunter um i think suzanne hemley's done some as well and i, I just absolutely love all their work and uh, you know <laughs> it's just it's idols basically and to sort of join that elite would be amazing but you must feel pretty awesome though about working on Lord of the Rings property, right? Yeah. Like, to me, I love Lord. To me, I kind of feel like Lord of the Rings is bigger than Magic: The Gathering, but I, I don't know. I guess we all have our ways of ranking different IPs, but I, I do see, I do understand the Magic: The Gathering as, as something that I've seen on a lot of artists' resume as they've done these cards. I think the Lord of the Rings is that it's already got almost constraints on it the way Tolkien described it and um, with the fantasy flight as well they only own the IP they can't use any of the stuff from the, the movies at all so that has to sort of be redone but still within the world of Lord of the Rings basically in all you know Middle Earth and there's that sort of slight restriction on it that you'd need to make like the Hall of Rohan sort of familiar to people that have read the books and everything but with magic the world's so vast and so big and they're sort of on the leading edge of contemporary fantasy art that you get some really nice different kinds of fantasy illustration basically in the industry which is just you know amazing to be a part of if you if you get that far ah well i love the distinction i think that's something that that a lot of people don't realize these little restrictions that are on different ips and there's all of these nuanced details that go into it that you think okay cool i'm in lord of the rings i'm gonna do this from the movie i was like whoa whoa whoa, wait you you, you can't yeah you can't (laughs) that's 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 different somebody owns that and we have to do something like that but not the same and yeah uh, it's like quite a lot of big companies have certain things that you can can't do like obviously um you know blizzards and valve have very distinct styles and you need to be able to work within those to work for those companies and if you can't do it you don't get hired basically so you need to be aware of what that particular company is looking for when you're yeah. you know considering hoping to work for them um most art directors will they can, they can sort of see talent even if you don't have something exactly like what they're wanting they'll figure out if you can do it or not by the rest of your work but if it, your work is too far out there then you're just not going to get hired which is why freelance you tend to have quite a few styles that you can work within so you can work for several different companies basically because right. you don't have a, a 
standard job so you need to be constantly finding work and inevitably it tends to come from lots of different different places have with different restrictions and sort of styles and what they want and everything right and how how long have you been a freelance artist for um well technically since i left uni which is 2009 but it's only in the last sort of few years that it's really been viable as sort of you know making money off it kind of thing because you need to be a certain level to get the amount of work basically um I did look into working for a studio but I couldn't find any in the local area or even weirdly within commutable distance because I live in a tiny bit of England and it's not exactly an artistic hub right that's actually an interesting thing to talk about this transition from uni to going the freelance route to actually making it happen and was there a shift or or something where you felt like okay finally this is happening I think it was actually when I first got the Lord of the Rings stuff because um that it, that sort of signaled a shift between sort of the really almost low paid but you know indie kind of stuff where they don't have a big budget for art basically and the kind of more commercial uh side of the business where they do have the budget for the for the art and it's that it was that sort of getting to that level where you can actually you know get the the amount of money that you sort of need to live on basically and was there do you feel like when you got out of university that you were ready for that level of work or did your work have to go through like a a big shift over over a period of a few years I, to get that commercial work because sometimes i feel like you're ready, but just nobody knows about you or you don't have that right connection that can open a door for you. And that's all that you're really needing. But in other, in other cases, it's just like, yeah, you graduated university, but you still have a long way to go to develop your skills, to get to the level, um, to play in the, in the sort of like the, we'll just call it air quotes, professional or, or the larger corporate, um, air arena. I personally, I could get like lower paid work because I wasn't at the level. I really needed to level up to, you know, get the the more serious um, professional work. Um, and it, it took several years for me to do it and sort of get into the right mindset and in fact, just do the right um, pictures to get noticed and get into that kind of, you know, kind of world. Because I was doing quite sort of low level semi, I was okay at creatures and I was terrible at backgrounds and landscapes but a lot of people already had um people that could do creatures and landscapes tended to be what people were looking for so I sort of made that shift and then I started getting the work and um I do the landscapes for the Lord of the Rings card game and I but I know my characters are nowhere near of the level that they require for the for the Lord of the Rings character cards but I'm my landscapes are so it's that kind of it's kind of trade-off Okay, cool. And we talked about this a little bit, but I there was you, you were telling me that there was a shift that happened with your landscape work, and I'm really curious about this because you know, looking at your artwork, your landscapes are amazing. Um, it really reminds me of what is, what is NCSoft's game? Ah, oh, I can't remember the name now. It's escaping me. I'll it'll come back to me before we we get done this podcast. Um, but yeah, let's talk about the shift that happened with your landscape work because you were focused on creatures and and characters, and then you started to to change things up a little bit. Yeah, I started to do um, warm ups basically in the morning, which is like lots of little sort of five ten minute sketches, often in black and white. And um, there was something in doing those; it was just really gratifying to have a simple image almost immediately. Um, that you know looked like a landscape and mountains and trees and everything within such a short space of time which then I could you know take further if if I wanted to whereas with the the characters and the creatures it just seemed to take a lot more faffing about to get them to a level where I was happy with them especially with the the characters and anatomy and cre- that kind of faces still take me hours and hours to do whereas I can knock out you know a full-blown sort of portfolio piece level landscape in the same time as it takes me to paint a nose so it's that kind of (laughs) instant gratification of the landscapes and it was it was really um nice to sort of just be doing those in the morning and then realize I actually really enjoy doing them and that that enjoyment makes you want to do a lot more
what do you think it is about landscapes that allowed you to just naturally because it listening to your to what you're saying it, it seems like naturally you are good at landscapes but did you study them a lot or do you take a lot of landscape photography do you do a lot of landscape sketching was there any history before that might be a clue and the reason why I'm ask is because I think it's awesome when when we can all find something that we're we just naturally excel at but I see a lot of people struggling at things that they're not naturally good at and I'm always trying to learn how other people have have found their strengths so that hopefully other people can learn from that and then find their strengths and then, you know, the world's a better place. (laughs) We're we're making the world a a little bit of a better place here. Um, I think for me, I'm especially drawn to sort of mountains and rural landscapes. And as a child, I spend quite a lot of time in the Lake District and the mountains are absolutely glorious with all the lakes and I just absolutely, I found it a magic, really magical place. And then I actually live right on the coast. So I also love doing seascapes and sort of water and, you know, the amazing kind of skies you just see when you're on the coast and sunset. And they really ins- inspire me, sort of the mix of those two. Because um, I don't live in or near a big city, I don't tend to draw architectural stu- stuff as often just because I'm not surrounded by it and not, um used to looking at it as much so if i am drawing a city i have to find hundreds of reference photos and you know go on google maps and google world or whatever it is and look at things because I, I don't see them around me but with the the mountains and and the sort of coastal seascapes that's really it's where i live and sort of where i i've got great enjoyment and happy memories and everything so i think that's sort of where why why those tend to come out so strongly in my work. And so just to be clear, that's where you live. And But were you also doing little sketches of, of that as well f- for a long time before? Or is it more of just because you live there, you already have that, you know, people talk about their visual library, that it just, you can already see it because that's what's normal to you. Like for me, I grew up in, I believe what's called like the flattest place on <laughs> earth. And so it's just flat. Like it's all these farms. And of course, there's little valleys in in hills and stuff but when I show friends videos of like driving on the highway from my little village into the city they cannot believe how like it's literally flat like I can do a 360 pan and it's just like everything is totally flat you can see a little bit of trees but there's no no mountains in the horizon or anything so my visual library is just like super flatness (laughs) and that's all I've got so for you was it were, were you doing studies of this as well or was it just Living in the environment is what did it for It's you. just been living in the environment. I, I should do studies of it, but I, I, I don't tend to because it's cold and windy most of the year. <laughs> so, um, but I, like, I have been, now, now I'm sort of, I feel like an adult. I can, you know, go and go actually go and take photos and go and do studies now if I want to. But back then, I just, you know, didn't have any transport and it was just relying on, on my visual library, basically, of, you know, stuff I can remember and you know, finding amazing reference pictures and inspiration on the internet as well as also really sort of um, broaden my horizons a bit, you know, different types of mountains and rocks and streams and coastland and stuff. Right. But I just think that's so cool that where you're to consider your environment a strength because I've never thought of that before. I don't know why living in a flat place would necessarily be a strength. (laughs) But, uh, you know, for me, I travel a lot and I see a lot of different cities and countrysides and cultures. So that's, you know, like a strength of mine is realizing what the world is like. Um, And everybody has, you know, these experiences that even though and the reason why I asked about doing the studies was that most of the most of the time I'm not doing studies. I feel like most people aren't doing studies of their environment. They're doing studies of photos they look at online or, you know, they're going to a museum or whatever else. But it's just living in the space yeah. is a strength. Yeah. And so I think that's really uh, like an, an insight that I didn't have before. So thank you for that. No problem. So let's talk a little bit about um, this this shift that you had. And, and like it was so gratifying. And, and you're doing these little uh, thumbnail sketches for five or ten minutes in the morning. How long would you do these sketches? Would you set aside an hour in the morning to do these thumbnail sketches? Uh, yeah, I set, well, I set aside between sort of half an hour and an hour. Um, depends on my, work, my workload in the day 
normally sort of if I'm really busy then you know I might only get 10 minutes in but if I've got you know not as much work on then I, I might do them for a couple of hours or all morning and perhaps take some of the little 10 minute ones and make them into more fully fledged illustrations which is what I like to do because I get all these um, ideas out and all the colours and yeah, just being able to experiment without any pressure of you know having to draw something is really really freeing because you start to it's almost a bit like seeing shapes in clouds um, you, you're not restricted by anything and there's no um, art director breathing down your neck or expecting a certain level of work so if something doesn't work it doesn't matter because you've only invested what five ten minutes into it you've made a mistake and then you learn from that mistake which is you know you don't learn unless you make mistakes which is really it, that that took a bit of processing and it took me a while to sort of realize that that these mistakes were you know happy accidents as Bob Ross says <laughs> And so how long were you doing this before you started to realize that you really enjoyed it? Or was it instantaneous that just right off the bat, you're like, wow, this is fun. I should do more of this. Um, it took a while because it's it's quite difficult to get into that kind of habit of doing these things, you know, five days a week or, you know, all week. And getting into that habit was really important and um, it takes a while for it to sort of, you know, get into your brain, and then you start think, you start looking forward to that time of not having to think, because I, I, I try not to think too much when I'm doing them, because that sort of interrupts the creative flow, you know, getting in the zone. And when you were doing these, did you have any reference up, or was it just go? It's just normally do. just go. Um, if I see a really sort of amazing picture, you know, on the internet or whatever, I'll sometimes have that sort of in my mind when so especially for color schemes um so I might pick those colors I've seen in you know the amazing picture that I saw the night before or whatever and sort of try and emulate that I'll very occasionally use a, a sort of stock photo as a base and just sort of pick colors off it or you know make a bit of a photo manipulation kind of thing but I tend to just paint from scratch just because I I enjoy that and it's it's so second nature to me now that that's the way I prefer to work. Okay, and then, so you're doing these, I'm really trying to nail down this because I would like to try it myself. So every morning, uh, spending about 30 minutes to an hour, but if you don't have time, 10 minutes is enough, and you're mostly working in black and white. Yeah, as well, I started in black and white, and I'll tend to go straight into color, but that's just personal preference. Um, my workflow when I first started was starting in black and white and grayscale and then adding colour on later, but now I tend to go straight into colour. So if I'm having a bad day, I might just work in black and white. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, so I think for me starting out, I'd probably just go with black and white or, or grey or whatever and just just see what happens yeah. and, and draw, draw things out of my mind. Yeah, well, just look for interesting shapes. You're not even necessarily trying to draw anything at all. You're just looking for pleasing looking shapes and as I said like uh, seeing shapes in clouds the clouds won't always make you know the perfect dog but you might end up with a sort of dog hybrid dragon thing that you, you can see in the shapes that you've made and it's that kind of not thinking is the hardest part of this little exercise not trying to draw something as soon as you try to draw something you you lose that sort of flow state that being in the zone and you start worrying about anatomy or you know what color it is or you know how how the hands look or the face might look and as soon as that worry creeps into this process it sort of stalls a little bit and it can it just ruins your little flow state okay so i i just focus on basically like shapes and composition there yeah and I'm using probably like a not not a very precise brush so that happy accidents can happen. Yeah, I do like my, my little textured brushes. Um, okay. There's one especially I really like that's got sort of a, a round bottom edge and almost speckled on the top, which gives really nice, almost paintbrush-like effect. And it's a little bit textured, so, it, you know, you get that variation in, in your mark making. Yeah, I, I've really started to play more with 
custom brushes and enjoying the randomness. Yeah. The, because I, I'm a total control freak. I remember being in, in art school and everything was like a fine liner on everything and perfect, trying to do perfect lines and using a ruler all the time. It was just so slow. Yeah. It, it was sort of, sort of technically impressive, but I feel like it was also dull at the same time. And now working, just be like splattering things around, well, digitally splattering, and uh, yeah. then just seeing where it goes. It's actually a lot of fun. So, okay, so I, I'm, I'm, we're at this stage, I'm doing it in black and white, I'm, get, I'm building up my daily habit, um, and then how do you, where do you graduate to next? Is it in that process, you, you, just, you just keep going and then you, you'll kind of naturally feel that you're ready to go to the next stage? It's like, hey, this is really fun. I'm, I'm actually having so much fun that I want to continue with this one particular piece that I was having the most fun on and just see where it takes me. Or h- how did it happen for you? Was it one day it just kind of ran away on you and then you were like, wow, I just spent the whole day and I have a finished portfolio piece or, or almost a finished piece. And this is this was an amazing process. I was in flow for almost the whole day. Yeah, I've forgotten to eat lunch a few times when that's happened. Um, just... There's been perhaps one or two pictures and I've normally just focused on one and then I've taken it into started rendering it up and putting colour on it or if I started in colour, you know, just fine tuning it and messing with the composition and and the colour and, you know, just, just finishing it off and I'll, you know, the, sort of get to lunchtime and, well, think what I think is lunchtime and then realise it's four o'clock and I've not eaten anything because I've just been completely in the zone with this picture and not, you know, nothing sort of interrupted me and it's it's really nice sort of place to be and that's you you live for those days when you're so in the zone that you you don't notice the world around you at all and you know you're not interrupted by social media or someone banging on the door or something just just in that state yeah and And yeah it's just normally just one I, i normally do like a it's an a4 sheet um, you know, sort of put into like perhaps ten or so little little thumbnails of varying ratios of rectangle, and there's normally perhaps one that you know the whole hour that I've spent on it that's perhaps worth taking further, and I will often do you know take that further the next day if I've got other work on, or just as you say, you know, spend the whole day do- doing this painting. And okay, so then let's let's go from. Uh, I feel like a, it's fairly easy to do thumbnails. Obviously, you can go really deep in it, but I, you know, as compared to doing a finished work, I see a lot of people being able to be successful or feel satisfied with their skill level for thumbnails. Um, but then, so you find that one that you really like, and you're gonna you're you just keep going with it. Did you find it was a natural process? Like, were were your skills because you've been doing the thumbnails and 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 your other work that your technical skills were at the level that it was easy for you to, to just take it much further with the landscape or did you find that there was a knowledge gap there that you had to go back in and study I, I'm not even sure what the right thing to study would be but you know I saw that on your your Facebook page that you're doing studies of clouds but it, do you find that there's those gaps that you're while you're working just like dang it there's a giant cloud base here and I I'm just not happy with the clouds or or you know oh I ha- I haven't painted this type of tree before so I need to go and do a separate study of these trees before I can continue continue this work or do you just try and let things flow and then over time it's like layers that even though they're different pieces it's like each time there's like a layer that's Things are just tighter at each time that you do another one of these um, pieces. Yeah, um, I will sometimes get reference photos or do studies of stuff that's you know I can't quite work out in my brain. Um, it depends a bit on the picture. Some of them are just they just flow completely easily, and then others I'll mess about with the composition, and faff about, and erase stuff, and change the ratio. And some of them are labors of love, really because I like the base concept so much that I'm willing to go through all all the effort to bring it to finish and then some of them just happen really really easily then I, I need 
very little sort of outside input, as it were, because um, my visual library allows me to, you know, paint rocks and clouds to that certain level. But there was one I did a pirate ship and it took me a long time. It took me longer to do the pirate ship, just a little silhouette than it did to sort of do the rest of the image because I've never drawn a pirate ship before. So I needed to, you know, look at what the mast looked like and the sails and how it sat in the water and all that kind of stuff. Ah, uh, th that definitely makes sense. I and I've been studying um, Kim Jung Ji's process and why he's such an amazing illustrator. And and what you just said makes a lot of sense. Where he was saying that what he tries to do is draw from. He tries to build his visual library and then just draw from it and place things inside boxes. So that's why he's able to work out the perspective very quickly. And because he's studied so many objects and drawn it from memory, then he's able to just, it almost looks like magic when you see him yeah. drawing. But it makes sense that if you were to put the amount of time and study with that kind of intention of drawing from your mind instead of drawing from reference, how you would you could theoretically get to that level. I'm not sure if it's actually possible to get to his level or if he's <laughs> a he's truly at a genius level. Um, but I, I feel like theoretically it's possible to get to that level. Whether or not people want to devote that much time is is uh, I, I'm not sure. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's nice to sort of because um, you, you're doing it so randomly at the start. You're not worrying that you might not be able to draw this, that or the other because you're not trying to draw anything. And then you sort of jump that hurdle when you get to it later on when you're sort of more in a study or reference gathering state. Yeah, I like that. And it's it, that's different than how I would have thought to approach it. But I, what I like about what you've laid out for us here is that it's, I feel like it's way more flow-based. So you stay in, in flow and if you're unfamiliar with this term flow, I feel like it's this word and this concept is just getting more and more momentum. So you can go and look up, you know, what is a flow state if you're looking to read into it more. Um, but what you've described is that it keeps you in that flow state longer. Yeah. So instead, I feel like gathering reference is not a flow state activity for most people. There's probably some people that are, that's what they're great at. And, and they could be in a flow state gathering and organizing reference. Um, but for artists, the, the longer that you can stay in that, the better. And um, I really like that. To me, what I heard was just keep going, stay in it as long as you can. And then when you hit a road bump, like see if there's anything else that you can already do and don't get hung up on that road bump until you're absolutely like hit that pirate ship moment yeah. where you're like, okay, now I, I've, I know that I'm kind of out of my area of expertise I got to go and do some some study and then come back to this and then finish it off and and then you're good yeah I'll quite often have a bit of a break as well and you know have lunch or walk the dog or whatever and just when I come back to it I feel like my brain's worked out the problem or read well you know while I was doing other activities and then I'm able to go straight back into it and not be sort of struggling with what I was struggling with before I stopped to have a break so that's a nice sort of Break breaks are good, but not too long. Okay, so I think I've got two questions and then we'll uh, finish off here. So I really want to encourage people to try this daily sketching exercise. But what I see is a lot of people just going straight into figures and having a rough go at it. Um, what do you think you could say to these people that could encourage them just to give this a shot? Because it's not, you know, we talked recent, uh, with an, art, an author recently and his big challenge was try something different for 10 minutes a day uh, and then, then just see what happens to your art career or anything that you want to focus on. Just 10 minutes a day. That was all that he, because I feel like even as busy as you are, as anyone is, Everybody has at least 10 minutes where you could try. There's all different things that you could try. But let's just say it's this thumbnailing. And I feel like it would actually take longer than, you know, it would, or your progress would be quite slow if you only spent 10 minutes a day. But it's a start. So for those people who are struggling uh, and starting out with their figure drawing or their creature drawing or 
the, and, and they're, you know, they're just having a tough time. What do you think you could say to them to get them started to try these uh, landscape thumbnailing experiments? Because I feel like if people did more of these experiments, they would find things that they're naturally good at, you know, like drawing vehicles or drawing landscapes or all different kinds of things. Um, what would you say to them? Um, not to worry about making mistakes, really, because that's how you learn and how you work out what works and what doesn't and if, you know if you are only doing it for sort of 10 minutes a day that 10 minutes isn't wasted even if you you spend it doing something that doesn't work for you um and and no this this thumbnail thing doesn't people like to either do it in sort of blocks and big bushes big brushes or actually just sketching it with more like a pencil tool um but it doesn't really matter which one you do as long as you w use the one that works best for you and then if you find something doesn't work, then you don't have to do it again kind of thing. But I would do it for a month and you'll see a huge difference in your first 10 minute um, block of drawing and your last 10 minute block of drawing because you've, you've got a month's worth of learned mistakes kind of thing that you can look back on and see that you've most likely improved. Perfect. Okay, and this is the last question um, because I want this to... I want to see if we can use the Pencil Kings audience to help you get hired at Magic. So I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. And what do you think is, is special about your work or what if there's somebody out there who is connected to Magic and we can help Katie you know, open a door or make a bridge or make a connection or something, what should we notice about your art specifically? I think it's my sense of color and how I use my colors in my pictures because I like to use sort of almost non-normal colours to, to paint stuff. Like I, I love doing sort of rainbowy trees and I think I did a pink river one time. It's just that kind of colour that still works but is a bit more out there than what you would expect. And, you know, not using black for my shadows and putting blue or purple or, you know, pinks or oranges in there instead. Um, yeah, I, I like my, I like my colours a lot. yeah. Definitely. And that's why I thought of the connection to NCSoft because there's a lot of interesting colors that are used there. The name of the, the game that they're working on still escapes me. So I'll have to look it up for the podcast notes. But thank you so much. And I'm looking at this, uh, the most recent picture here on Facebook call, and it's titled Morning Warm, Warm Up featuring our old friend, the traveling stick salesman. And I really like the painterly feel of this one. Yeah, that's been one of my favourites for a while now. Um, I was just proper in flow state for that. I think I spent about six, seven hours on it all in one block just because it was just working so well on the colours and the textures of it. Um, yeah, very beautiful. Thank you. All right, Katie, where is the best place for people to find you online? Um, if you go to my website, which is www.cova.co.uk, and that's K-O-V-A-H, that's got links to all my social media and my email if you want to hire me. Um, and everything everything is on that sort of base page on the contacts. So, yeah, that's a, that's probably the best place. Um, I'm also on Perfect. Twitter and Instagram and stuff, but all the links are on there. So. Awesome. I love it when it's all in one place because it's easy for people to go there. So kova.co.uk, K-O-V-A-H. And we'll also have show notes for this as usual. And if you didn't get the link or whatever, you can go to pencilkings.com slash podcast as usual and get everything there. Thank you so much, Katie. Any Thank last you. words before we before we wrap up or you're, we're good? Uh, um, we're good. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks so much. I really appreciate you breaking down this process of having the breakthrough to go into landscapes. And if somebody does this, email me. I, I want more email from the podcast. I feel like sometimes it feels like these messages are going out to nobody. Uh, once in a while, somebody does drop me a line. If somebody tries this, please send me a, a, a link or something. I'll, I'll talk about your website. I'll talk about your Facebook page. I don't <laughs> care. I just want somebody to take action so that we know that, that we're not just sending this into the void. Thank you very much, Katie. And thank you. And I'll be back next week. Okay, bye. Good demand patience. Skill, years of practice. Ah, you talk like a fool. I would trade a century of practice for an ounce of inspiration.